years ago, Apollo 11 took the first humans to the moon, making Neil Armstrong the first human ever to walk the surface of the moon. While computers of the 60s were very big and took the space of entire rooms, today's smartphones fit in your pockets and are millions of times more powerful than all of NASA's combined computing power in the 60s. Since then, the technology and engineering have been vastly improved. The people in the 60s were so enthusiastic about the future, to the point that they began speculating flying cars would become the norm as we entered into the 21st century. It's true, as Elon Musk once said, people sometimes think technology just automatically gets better every year, but it actually doesn't. It only gets better if smart people work like crazy to make it better. That's how any technology gets better. Well, in today's video, we look at the latest tech which would fuel the new space race. A quick recount of the last space race. When I say space race, what do I mean exactly? In today's time, there are rocket launches which act as a tool for delivering satellites or warheads. The former take place nearly 200 times every year. India currently holds the world record for delivering 104 satellites on a single rocket. There are also rocket systems that are used as defense systems to counter ballistic missiles like United States THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or Russia's S-400 missile defense systems to intercept ballistic missiles. So the race to space in today's time might seem odd, but 60 years ago, the situation was quite different. Much of today's progress in engineering and technology happened thanks to the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Although, might I add, fear, suspicion, urgency, and a drive to be superior than the other country were pivotal in the enhancement of technology. Like every other race, it had its end, and it ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union, who couldn't keep up with its Western counterpart. While it might seem that only two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union, had the capability of launching rockets to space, it was Nazi Germany's V-2 rocket that became the first ever man-made object to reach space in June of 1944, although might I add it was built purely for military purposes. After the war, the technology behind the V-2 fell into the hands of the US and the Soviet Union. Many Nazi scientists and engineers were recruited into the space programs of the US and the Soviet Union. Just getting to space wasn't the primary objective of both the countries. A quick word, though, about the definition of space. While NASA and the US Air Force consider the boundary line for space at an altitude of 50 miles, or 80.5 kilometers, the FAI, the global organization that records air and space feats, recognizes space at 62 miles, or 100 kilometers. The greater goal of the space race, or rather the military race, was to actually achieve orbit. Satellites that could circumnavigate the planet made spy planes that could penetrate deep into enemy's territory obsolete. Vital images of sensitive installations are just minutes away from observation, thousands of miles away. The Soviet Union became the first country to achieve orbit when Sputnik 1 became the first man-made object to complete a full orbit of Earth. The true finishing line, however, shifted to reaching our natural satellite, the Moon, when one of the Soviet satellites reached, or rather, should I say, crash-landed into the Moon at 7,000 miles per hour, or 11,200 kilometers per hour. This time, it was not about military achievement, rather, it was about making history. The problem with the digital or analog systems of the 1950s and 60s were their size or lack of processing power required for calculating complex space maneuvers. This led to the invention of the integrated circuits, aka chips. They were powerful, smaller in size, and were quite reliable to be fitted into the rocket systems that would take the first astronauts to the moon. The modern concept of writing software still hadn't come to fruition in the 1950s. Far from it, actually. Software engineering was coined during this period when it became increasingly known that all of the relevant and important tasks would be handled by the software on board the Apollo guidance computer. 
Apollo Guidance Computer, aka AGC, was the epitome of engineering achievement in the 1960s. The software that it ran was highly sophisticated by the standards of the time. Although the software written for the Apollo missions were largely responsible for its success, it wasn't a smooth sailing. Neil Armstrong almost didn't land on the moon because of a programming error. We'll talk about this error in our next video. In the early 1970s, President Nixon ended the Apollo program, a program which cost the United States taxpayer $25 billion. Just to give you an idea of how much that is, the US federal budget for the year when Armstrong walked on the moon was around $180 billion. By that time, it was not sustainable for the US to keep sending astronauts to the moon, nor could the Soviets afford to dream about human beings living on the moon. A Skylab, a temporary space station, was agreed upon. But one thing became clear. There was no money to put humans even in the lower Earth orbit, let alone to the moon or another celestial object. The current space race begins. On September 28, 2008, Falcon 1 became the first privately developed launch vehicle to go into orbit around the Earth. SpaceX, started by Elon Musk in 2002, had to encounter three failures which almost bankrupted Elon Musk before he received a contract from NASA to develop cargo to the International Space Station. After nine years on March 30, 2017, a similar rocket was launched from Kennedy Space Center carrying a geostationary satellite. It was on this day, something very special happened. Not only did it successfully launch a satellite and deployed it into orbit, but the rockets which took the satellite safely returned back and landed on an autonomous platform somewhere on the Florida coast. It was the first time ever people around the world witnessed the reusability of the Falcon 9. Musk already envisioned a plan where rocket boosters were reused, which would make spaceflight much cheaper and accessible to all. But unlike NASA, SpaceX engineers had a more revolutionary approach. NASA's approach was straightforward. Its boosters would burn till it had no fuel and then get ejected in free fall back to Earth where they would be retrieved somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. This wasn't good enough for Musk for obvious reasons. It included the cost and the time for retrieval and a significant amount of work had to be done for the boosters to be ready for another mission. He explained it by saying, If we had to dump airplanes after reaching the destination, the cost for air travel would be phenomenally high. He envisioned rocket launches as airplanes taking off. For that, the requirements of the boosters and the engine would have to change dramatically. SpaceX engineers envisioned rocket engines which had multiple capabilities, like thrust vectoring, throttling, and a restart function. Basically a jet engine, although the shutdown and the restart function had to happen within a moment's notice. They eventually wanted rocket boosters to behave like airplanes, but completely autonomous where the boosters themselves landed on structures where there's minimum intervention or work required. With all its requirements, the first Falcon 1 launched in March 2006. Like every revolutionary project, it ended with failure, where the rocket blew up just 40 seconds into its flight. Somebody might think that even after launching rockets for 50-odd years, how come it's still so difficult to build and launch a new rocket? But, alas, building rockets virtually means building an unstable bomb. There's a thin line that separates them from being vehicles for space or highly explosive devices which are brutally expensive. A normal rocket only has to be given an upward thrust, while Falcon rockets not only have to go up, but also have to come back down safely. Hence the return stage needed to have aerodynamic control. In the 1960s, the Saturn rocket which took the first humans to the moon used aluminum alloy. But it was considered to be too heavy, so the Falcon uses an aluminum lithium alloy. For the Falcon to land in an upright manner the same way it was launched, it required additional thrusters to position it. Aerodynamic fins were also introduced, tucked away only to be deployed in the return flight. All of these had to be controlled by the computer systems on board the Falcon. While one might be mistaken here that cutting-edge tech might be used where custom processors, etc. may have been manufactured or built in-house, the reality is that dual-core x86 processors were used, meaning off-the-shelf chips were used. The computers run a Linux-based operating system, but the software used was developed completely in-house. 
Radiation in outer space can fry chips easily, particularly the ionizing radiation. SpaceX had to decide between radiation hardening or tolerant. The radiation hardening required the chips to be custom manufactured in such a way that they're thinner than their commercially available cousins, as thinner chips absorb less radiation but can also restrict the calculations that could be performed, leading to an increase in cost. The radiation tolerant chips essentially skip this by having three sets of processors for every computer system. It acts like a failsafe where if one chip is affected, the other takes over. The Falcon rockets are designed to be fully autonomous. The only time a human steps in is to ensure if it's a go or a no-go, meaning that after launch, the Falcon 9 is on its own. The earlier Saturn rockets could be manually controlled either by the crew or by ground control. SpaceX has really come a long way since then. Even in the docking missions of ISS, everything is performed by the computer systems on board, although the final docking procedure occurs only after the ISS crew gives the green light. More players in this race SpaceX isn't the only one who has its sight on Mars and beyond. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin are quietly working on their reusable rocket named New Glenn, a heavy lift launch vehicle capable of carrying people and payloads. To watch our earlier video on more such players in the era of the new space race, check the link in the description below. So we'll leave it right here. If you liked the video, please hit that thumbs up button and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Visit our Patreon and consider supporting for behind the scenes action. Comment below any companies or topics that you'd like us to cover in our next video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.